thanks again for having me. And what I want to show you today is how to securely use JavaScript core in your own Mac applications. The idea here is that JavaScript is basically the only way nowadays that you can ship plugins or scripts with your apps on macOS that is not broken since Big Sur, I think, because Ruby and Python and all these other scripting languages were, were created from the operating system. The JavaScript core framework is still available and it doesn't depend on an actual runtime. So you can use the framework from within the app. And the nice, yeah, the bad thing about this is you have to use JavaScript. The nice thing is it's built in and basically works since forever because the framework is so old. So it's not like new technology. It works with really old stuff. And the thing I've found is that you can actually make plugins for your applications that don't expose the app internals or the user's file system or any sensitive data unless you actually decide to expose this, which means that plugin installing can become rather safe. It's easy to break things, but it's also easy to make things secure. And today I want to show you how I approach this to ship application plugins with my app in a week or two to beta testers. And the app I'm talking about is the Archive. It's a note-taking app. And here you see a demo, demo note on the right side with some syntax highlighting for Markdown. On the left, there's a list of search results, which is currently showing just everything because I didn't search for anything. And yeah, the layout of the application is there's search to the left, there's content to the right, iOS or both. Okay, Mac iOS or both is first. iOS will work the same way, but I'm not providing an iOS sample app at the end. So good question. Thanks, Werner. This is, this, this is, I'm, I'm, I'm developing macOS applications first and foremost, but the approach is a possible cross-platform because I'm not using anything Mac specific as long as you have access to the JavaScript core framework. So what you see here is, well, a Mac application, as I said, there's text on the right, there's a list of nodes or managed files to the left, and these are the inputs we're going to explore later. Like how, how can, can a script or plugin access selected nodes on the left or the selected text on the right? How can a plugin insert text for the user on behalf of the user? How can a plugin create a new file that is then managed by the app? How can a plugin change a file that is not visited at the moment, that is not visible in the editor, but still managed by the app itself? Like always update the same statistics file, which is a use case I'm going to demonstrate to you today. Um, one, one of two, because that's one of two plugins that I finished writing, where I finished writing. So this is the app. And the basic action that I want to explore is given some, some app interface. When, whenever the user performs some interaction, I want to execute JavaScript to perform a change. That's the very, very basic abstract flow of things. It can be a toolbar button, as I try to sketch here. It could be a shortcut. It could be a main menu entry. It could be a proper button. It could maybe even automatically be triggered when a user types certain text, like, like, like macro expansions, things like that. So on, on some trigger, do execute JavaScript so that some change happens. This is the, this is the basic approach of making plugins work in the application. This basically means that I have this JavaScript and for any user interaction, I'm, I'm have, I have to execute the JavaScript. I have to go through the JavaScript script itself to do something. And I initially had no clue how to approach this the best way because I never used the JavaScript core framework before. So like, like any good programmer, I invented the wheel all over again, possibly. But well, this, this is my talk today and I want to show you how I did it. And I hope you have some feedback for this. So the simplification of user interaction and some output or some changes that we have inputs and we have outputs, which is depicted on the left. There's the input arrow, and then there's the JavaScript stuff happening, and then there's some output or effect happening. And this is also a very well-known abstraction, which is usually called the black box. 
A black box could be a function, a black box could be a class, a module, a black box can be a whole program. You, you don't need to know what the program is doing when you execute it. The important thing is that you, you, you kind of know that the program is doing the correct thing given certain inputs to produce outputs you expect. And I try to approach the JavaScript stuff the same way. So as one possible black box that we're going to explore is like the basic function. Given some input to a function, we expect some output to a function. This is, this is the most fundamental thing we have in Swift, let's say. That is, you, you don't need classes, you don't need modules. Thinking about functions, this is already the black box applied to a very, 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 very basic feature. And we're going to approach this whole thing from that. We, we're not, we, we're not, well, I try to not introduce too many, too many object trees or complex, complex uh, magic interactions. I'm trying to make functions that I understand that perform certain tasks and then produce a change. So looking for people who, for some of you maybe, who have never looked at the JavaScript core framework, this is a screenshot from the documentation. If you look at the Apple Docs as of this month, November 2020, this is what you see. The JavaScript core framework has a couple of classes and one protocol, and then there's a C API, which is a bit different, and then there's JavaScript core constants, which we're also not going to look at. Most things I found can be already can already be accomplished by using the JS context class. That's an execution environment. What does this mean? An execution environment is basically the script as it is running, the JavaScript code when you execute it and, and what happens to the, yeah, where the variables are stored, what kind of functions are available, where the objects live that the JavaScript contact, the JavaScript file or the JavaScript script can access. Basically everything lives inside the context and I think that's why it's called context because it's such a generic name. It's just the thing wherein the script is running. The virtual machine, I, I don't even recall what it does. I know that I needed it for something to, to get to a context, but I can't, please don't ask questions about the virtual machine because I, I would have to look up everything. Let's, let's defer this to later because the most important piece that I found for this talk is the context and the JS value that you see below and the JS managed value, which is something we will completely ignore. This is important. If you have worked with core data, for example, you will know the NS managed object and the JS managed value is kind of similar. It's bridging into the JavaScript context and automatically updates when you mutate an object from within JavaScript and the JavaScript side sees values reflected as you change them in your Swift code on these managed values. This is this is very handy, I guess, but it's something that I find, well, unnecessary for my purposes. So we stick to the basic values and the context. And if we look at the context in more detail, then we will see that the context has some functions, but there's one thing that is reflecting what we've just talked about, or what I just demonstrated. That's this evaluate script method. It takes an input, that's the JavaScript code, and it produces an output in case the script returns a value. Why? I, I, I would rather I would rather not return a value because I wanted my plugins to to be written in a way that they perform side effects. So, if you think about a function that returns a value but want to make it, let's say, asynchronous, then the next step you would do is to pass a completion handler and not return a value, and then pass the same value into the completion handler for later processing. And that's basically what we're going to do. We're treating this evaluate script function as the main entry point, as the, the core player here, but we, we're going to ignore the return value. The actual return value of the script will be captured differently going to demonstrate you in a bit. So back to the JavaScript. This is the JavaScript script, the file, the, the script contents or the script code. And what we're going to do is we're taking this and then we're 
putting this into the evaluate or execute script function to well make the context do something with this, the script. But still, even when the context is executing a JavaScript code string, it would need inputs to see, in the case of my app, the notes, the selected text, and we have to teach the JavaScript code itself how to access this. So even with the JS context method that I've just shown you, we still need to figure out inputs and outputs to the script itself. And as I hinted at, my approach is quite functional, which means functional input output. I'm going to, I'm not going, I'm, I'm not leaning into the, the Haskell I own it, if, if you're familiar with that, because I'm not familiar with that. I just know that it exists and that you're basically able to do functional programming without any side effects and that the IO thingy captures all these side effects and and enqueues them. And since the JavaScript code itself has no clue about the rest of the app, I'm introducing similar things, at least from my understanding. I'm introducing a function for input and a function for output and the script. I'm, I'm teaching the script to call a function for the input and I call a function for the output. And then the script isn't, isn't blind anymore and isn't a useless waste of computing power, but can actually produce effects and outputs. With this input and output in mind, this is what we're going to do in the evaluation loop. We are getting a value. This is inside the JavaScript that you write, and we're calling some kind of input. This is a function that is injected into the JavaScript code. You call the input, and then you get whatever this returns and can then work with the a value variable or constant to do some meaningful, yeah, some, some meaningful task like compute statistics, like how many, how many nodes do, do you have in your in your in your node folder or something like that. And when you're finished and want to do something with the result, then you call another function that is taught to the JavaScript context and the JavaScript code, the output function, and you pass the result in there. And this is what I meant when I when I said I don't want to return the result, the another value. I want to forward another value to a function because then you can call the output function multiple times for multiple outputs. You could call not, not call the output function at all, which is kind of useless because then the script doesn't do anything. It, it would compute something, but then yeah, it, it's, 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 not, it's not reporting the results back. So you would need at least one call for this, but you don't need to return this synchronously. You can also do asynchronous work. I think that's the case, at least because I haven't tried to do anything too fancy with my JavaScript. But the idea here is that this pattern of output callbacks and input functions already allows to, to write interesting, interesting scripts. And since the output is a callback, that is injected into the script. You can you can you can copy paste whole JavaScript libraries from the web that do complex things. Maybe that even let's say um, that, that that do a statistical analysis and then create images or some other kind of visualization, which maybe even takes some time, and then pass the result to the output function as a parameter, and there you go. So this is the basic approach. To make this a bit more concrete and less, less abstract, I want to show you a rough, rough similar yeah, simplification of the code I'm using. So the plugins in my app are really simple. A plugin object has a manifest. We're going to look at this in a second. It has the actual JavaScript and a checksum. The manifest declares the kinds of inputs and outputs that the plugin requests from the application. I'm going to show you what this looks like and why in a second, but it's basically all the metadata. The inputs, outputs, the author, so everything about the plugin. The plugin itself, so to speak, is the JavaScript code. That's just a string. The JavaScript type is, is a struct, but it just has one value. It's a string for the code and it doesn't do anything else. It's just a very thin wrapper. 
And the checksum is important. It's a sharp 22256, I think, hash. I, I can't even recall, but it's it's a it's a computed hash from the file to make sure that when the user enables a plugin, that this enablement is then stored with a checksum. So if you change the file on disk, the app will notice that the checksum no longer matches and prevents and can prevent the plugin from automatically loading. Again, in the demo that will follow, I will show you what this looks like. It will make it it will it will feel rather straightforward when you see it. But the checksum is important for that part. It's a late edition, but the manifest and the JavaScript are the core parts here. So the manifest it declares input and output. That's these are subtypes, and they are this whole thing is codable. So you can load this from a JSON file. And it contains a lot of other metadata. We don't need to look at all the grayed out stuff. It's well metadata for the plugin, like the name. The type. The name is actually the ID. The title is a user facing title. But all of this is just um, interesting metadata for the user, so the app can present something nice in a, in a plugin list. Let's say. At the same time, the inputs and outputs are where the real complicated stuff is happening. And it's not really that complicated, but it's the most complicated. The rest is really, really dumb. So if we look at the inputs, that's again the functional, the, the, the input function, but it's the declaration of the expected input functions. It's basically saying this plugin needs, for example, access to all nodes or to the selected text. It can also declare that it wants all nodes and the selected nodes and all text and the selected text. What does this mean? All nodes in the context of my app means you get, well, all nodes that are visible in the folder that are known to the app. And the selected nodes input would just return the currently visited, the currently, the, the node the user is currently editing. And if there's no node open at the moment, well, then this would return nil or null. Same for text. All text means give me the complete content of the node that is currently being visited. And if there's none where there's no text, or the selection could mean just the, the marked region, which could be useful for replacements. So you can say, yeah, one, one example that I haven't implemented, but that's that that will make sense to you, I think, is refactoring. Think think about the use case of selecting a part of text in the node, right click, refactor, extract into new file. It's basically what Xcode is supposed to offer, but usually doesn't. But this would perform, this would create a new node, paste the text inside that was selected. But to do this, it would have to read the text that is selected so it can be extracted. And after the, the new file was, is created, it will also replace the selected text with a link or reference to the new file. And for stuff like that, it's important to not just get all the node text, but also the selected text or representation of the selection so that you have access to, to well, just that. But that's just the input part. The output um, has, to, has to offer similar facilities. So this is the output. The output that I'm currently declaring is either a file output, which can mean change a certain file, a known file with a static file name, like just the statistics.txt, or create a new file according to the rules of the app, which means that the plugin doesn't have a say which file is going to be created. The app is creating the file, and then yeah, the plugin has to, has to live with the result. And then there's the text output. It's also optional. So you, you don't need outputs. You don't need both outputs. You don't need either of these outputs, but it would make sense to request some kind of output access. And so the text output is just one case that's possible at the moment. It's insert. And insert will replace either the selection, if, if there's any, or, try, or, or type text at the current cursor position, which is in, in a text view, the same operation. Inserting means at the point of the insertion point, insert a substring. And if the insertion point is actually not a point, but a region or range, then override this with some other text. 
So there's just this, this one, one interesting case at the moment. There could be more like append or prepend to the file, but yeah, I haven't explored that. This is, this is complicated enough already and useful enough for a first release. These are the basics that I'm going to show you and that are shipping in the next weeks in my app. So what happens when we have the inputs and outputs? The, the inputs and outputs are going to be executed. And I wrote a wrapper for the JavaScript context here. First, just give you a bit of a moment to, to orient yourselves. There's this execute function. It takes the JavaScript, which is just the code, and then it calls the configure method here. And the configure method injects into the JS context, the JavaScript context from the JavaScript core framework. It injects a reference to input, output, and utils. Input and output are, let's say, the, the input function is the input thingy, the output function is the output thingy, and utils is another global variable that is created this way, and it contains some other things. And we're not going to look at the, the utils because they, they, they don't do much interesting stuff. But the input and output is interesting for our case here. So what, what, does this, what does this JS context subscript with the input and output strings do? It, it creates a new global variable inside of the JavaScript execution context in the environment. So the script doesn't have to declare input and output variables. It can use them. And before this change, the script couldn't. So we're injecting input and output into the context for execution, and then we have access to this. Afterwards, we're evaluating the script. That's the method we looked at in the documentation. You see here that the code is being, the, the string of the JavaScript code is being fetched. It's being evaluated, and it's being evaluated after the three global helper variables, the global references have been declared. So you can, you can think of this as um, input, output, and utils being declared first, then the rest of the, the script is being uh, copy-pasted afterwards, and then the result is being executed. And in the end, if everything is finished, we return from this wrapper function, from this execute function, we return the effects of the output collector. The output collector is a reference to, is, is an object that is being bound to the JavaScript context output, and the effects are being computed at the very end, after the script elevation is complete. Let's have a look at the output collector and the effects. So this is a JS exports protocol. This is the only JavaScript magic binding, let's say, that, that I'm using as far as I can remember, at least. This output collector, JS exports, that is the output collector, and it declares the, the available object properties, attributes, functions, whatever that JavaScript has access to. Let's look at each one of these. So there's this node content collector, JS exports. It's a very, it's, it's not public API, so I picked a very technical name, sorry. This file name and content string these, these are two, two properties of this collector, and these correspond to the manifest output file declaration that we've looked earlier. So there's the file name, there's content, and this corresponds to, 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 to part of the output. If you want to change, declare a file name that's going to be created, the script is going to evaluate this. And the content is being, sorry, the file name is not going to be changed. It's a, it's a get only, it's a read only property. So that's the input file name. And the content is the supposed new content of a file if it's going to be created. It's also going to be used when the file, when an existing file is being replaced, when the contents are replaced. So this is the new content of a new node or a new content of an existing node after the script execution has finished. The other collector of outputs is the insert collector, and it corresponds to the insert case, which is the only case for the text output that I've shown you, and the only one that I've came up with so far. 
you can, it's, it's a mutable property. So the script can set this text value to some string. And at the, the, the end of the script execution, we will know what the supposed replacement text is going to be. The example I mentioned earlier was insert for the refactoring, if you remember, extract something from the current node and replace the selection after the refactoring is complete and the extraction is complete, replace the selected text with a reference to the new node, like extract function in Xcode. And this will be that this text property will be set to the reference to the new node. And this is then in turn being evaluated by the app and it will know what to do with it. It will know how to manipulate, manipulate the text view to change the content at the insertion point or at the selected range. So this is all the output collector stuff. And you see the output collector, its three properties correspond to the node content collector for a new file, node content collector for a change file or file change, and the insert collector for a text change. That's why the node content collector pro protocol was a bit, it's a bit weird because it's not a one-to-one -one match to just create a new file and to just change a file. I might as might maybe consider splitting this up in two, into two protocols. I haven't yet. It worked so far and I'm, yeah, the API isn't fine. API isn't finalized. So this is how things work. The output, the, the global output variable inside of the JavaScript context has a property that is new file. It has a property that is change file and has a property that is insert. And then each of these have sub properties like text, file name, and content. We're going to take a look at a script and then it will be easier to follow later. So to look at the script, I have to open Xcode and leave this keynote presentation. So this is probably the best, yeah, the, the best point in time to to make a short break for you to ask questions. Yeah. Maybe, maybe I have a question. So so basically this is probably really good for for text processing, I think, right? So if you would want to make a, a very complex plugin. Mm -hmm. I mean, also let's say maybe it has a has a UI and, <laughs> and it's maybe very complicated with mm -hmm. JavaScript, but what do you think are the limits here? So mm -hmm. I mean, yes, maybe with your input and output, you, you could define a lot there and maybe you could also define UI components there. Mm -hmm. But as far as I can see now, to me, it, to, to me, it looks like it's it's uh, very well fitted to to let's say text processing or editor stuff. Mm -hmm. But uh, for more complex plugins, maybe it could get too complex. Mm -hmm. What do you think? I'm I'm thinking of like the the sketch design design app. I, I yes. guess, guess every one of you knows this. So they they support plugins that can either display windows with controls or maybe sidebar content. I'm, I'm not really sure, but plugins can display their own UI and then do stuff. I haven't tried, so I don't know if the evaluation has to be changed. If the I think the context has to be kept alive for while the plugin is active, so it can 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 be stateful. I think that's that's a change that needs to be made, and then also, as you said, how, how do you how do you make the UI stuff available? I believe the sketch people offer the basically bridge or import, so to see, so to say, the, the Coco framework, the AppKit stuff, and and all the NS windows, NS buttons, stuff like that. You can access this directly in the JavaScript code, so you can. Yeah. Maybe maybe Objective C similar to Objective C, you can write your UI in JavaScript, and this is being all bridged to Objective C land or dynamic dispatch land, and then being executed there, and then you get some UI. But you also have to well write all your view controllers there. And it's it's getting the, the examples I, I saw were interesting, but they were also very complicated. So I don't believe that it's simple to write these plugins, but it's possible. So you're right. The, the approach I'm showing is evaluate, finish evaluation, and then report the result after evaluation is finish, finished. You could also make this observable. Instead of collecting the outputs in the end, assume there is no end, and then 
just collect the outputs as the objects are changing. The JS exports protocol, which I used for my output collectors, supports this already, as far as I'm aware, because you have to declare these as dynamic and then you can use key value observation. So this would work, but I'd rather not go go in that direction too far. With SwiftUI, it could be interesting because it's more declarative. Maybe you can bridge this with custom code, with the custom bridging, but exposing AppKit, hmm, not sure. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Mm, okay, Marco asks, your presentation title points out the aspect of secure existenceability. I understand the checksum implementation. Are there other aspects? Yes. The, if, if the manifest is not declaring the inputs and outputs, the script doesn't have access to them. That's the rule of my framework of the library that I'm writing. You only get access to the output collectors that you declared in the manifest file, which means when the user activates a plugin, you can display what the plugin has access to. And then you can also then you can also protect users from maybe from from file access. Let's say users are only allowed unless they they explicitly give consent. They are only allowed to do text changes. All the other plugins can't be enabled. That's like I'm thinking about this for the app um, myself. Actually, this is like tier zero um, access. To, to, to dangerous features. And then it gets more and more dangerous, like create a file in the background, potentially overwriting existing files. This is this is this is already getting getting a bit dangerous, but it's not as dangerous as delete files or maybe access files outside of the application's directory of, of, of nodes. So if you if you have one directory full of nodes and the plugin tries to write to a file or you teach your plugin system to write to a file in, in the downloads or documents folder, this, this can, can, can get really weird. If you replace user files outside of the current scope of the application. So I'm not even allowing this by not offering an output port that can do this, but we are actually considering to add a tier four, five, six, let's say a danger zone where these things are allowed. Like, if if people if people really really switch the liver pull the plugs do do whatever and 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 and, and scribble their consent on paper and fax it into our offices, then then they get access to this stuff and then they can then they can do the most dangerous things. Until then, yeah, it, it starts it starts innocently enough, and that's the the state of the library at the moment the stuff that i've shown you in the code is is everything that the framework can do at the moment but i can teach it more outputs i can teach it to output to different files maybe produce exports on on the desktop or wherever people put their exports of of notes like html markdown to html conversion markdown to pdf conversion markdown a list a list of markdown files whole selection of markdown files as input make a book from this like pdf and then create pdf epub html and then potentially maybe upload this to somewhere but i not i really don't want to go into the direction to teach the plugin authors to or the plugins to do web requests I'd, I'd rather leave that out but it's a possibility and the security part is that the app can gate features for certain user pro levels you can even do this with inner purchases you can say well the free 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 version can access the basic stuff and you have to pay like you have to 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 get the subscription or the pro tier or whatever to get access to the more advanced plugins all right you're welcome all right no more no more questions at the moment that's good so we can start with the demo part i'm just I'm starting by executing the example app, and then I'm going to show you some pieces of code there. So the example app that I finished to uh, modify today is this demo editor. It's just a very, very, very basic text view. And to the left, you see this user interface stuff is also part of the userland.js framework. The example app just comes with the window to the right. 
And this one here is all part of the framework. And you see, it starts with um, a warning sign. Whoa, the yellow, the yellow doesn't work on dark. Sorry, didn't test this. It it says, let let me burn your retinas. I'm going to switch the app to light mode. Then you can at least read what's what's being written here. So this find orphaned notes plugin is a plugin with warnings, and it says plugin integrity warning. The plugin appears to have changed on disk. Please verify nothing is wrong. If you want to continue, you need to re-enable it. This is the checksum part. I deliberately started the app with a different checksum than the one that is actually used for this plugin. So. I wanted to get feedback if this feature is working. What does this mean? It does mean I can't I can't interact with anything here. Let me this a bit. I can't change the shortcut. I can't use use it even though it was enabled. Let's say the last time the app was active, but then the script changed on disk, and now I can't use my beloved plugin anymore. The thing I have to do is to re-enable it. And now it's available here. I can set a shortcut. And I can see what the plugin is doing. I, I should have maybe looked at this before I blindly enabled the plugin. It can read all my notes, so it doesn't read the selected notes, just the all notes, which is a sp specific input. It doesn't have access to the text that I'm selecting. And the effect when running is it modifies a file that is called orphans.txt. It's always the same file, and it's managing this file, so it's not it's not outputting the result anywhere. It's just outputting it into a managed file declared by the plugin. Um, if you already have this file, well, it will still be overwritten. You need to figure out what to do with that case. But uh, well, do, let's just pretend this is this is not happening. And then there's this other plugin, Statistics of All Tags. This is more interesting for the demo that I'm going to send you to play around with. It lists all the hashtags in all your notes and how often each one has been found. The copywriting isn't ideal. The result is sorted so you can spot which tags you use the least often, often also the most often. And it's bound to, to a shortcut, but again, it's not available. It has access to all my notes and it can create a new file. I need to enable this plugin as well. And now you see ah, the shortcut was actually command one. This is also being reflected here. So inside my text view, this demo application fakes a list of notes and, and, and it pretends that it runs the, the result, but it doesn't actually do anything on disk. Okay, so this is this is the effect. I, I have this bound to a shortcut. If you have text here, and now you run the command one shortcut for the statistics of all tags, you see it, I'm, I'm printing, I'm assembling a printout of the effects. I'm not executing them because here in the example app, no things are managed. I mentioned I didn't get that far. Here's a list of all tags being used. Two times the JS hashtag, one time the hashtag professional. And on completion, it should show the file that was being, being created, the new file that is. So there's other kind of effect, not just mutations, but also what's the app supposed to do. I also have options for showing a notification, things like this. If long running process is finished, this is going to show the file that is being created. Now, how do we get here? Let me show you in the example. It's all in one big view controller. I'm going to enlarge the font a bit and try to hide the invisibles because in dark mode, they're quite obnoxious. Okay, this is the view controller. This is executing the plugin in the, in the, in the context. This is the function that I've shown to you. Context, execute the JavaScript code interpret the effects. This is this is where the, the tricky stuff is happening. Kind of. So we have the text view, we get the text storage to mutate it. And here I'm faking, I'm inserting the string representation. What I get here is I can enumerate over all the text effects that were provided by the output collector. When, when the output collector finishes, I can enumerate all the text effects, could be multiple. And one is insert text and it's going to replace characters in the text view for this demo app. But I'm not having a plugin at the moment. I didn't 
whip up a demo plugin for you that inserts text at the cursor position. So this is effectively not used at the moment. What is being used, as the file says, it the effects when one is create new file and when this is run, it is modifying an existing file. So we're just looking at the file effects below that are actually being dumped into the text view. This is just a better kind of console output. Let me let me run the other script. It would find orphans. Orphans are basically nodes without incoming links, nodes with no backlinks. You could say if, if that doesn't make sense, it's like if you go to Wikipedia and you don't create a page from a link, but you just create a page and then never link to it, then it lives in, 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 in you know, unconnected space. It lives outside of the network. And this is a script to find these unconnected pieces in your node collection. And there's actually one. And it's supposed to be called, how hard is it to start JS? And here it says there are two tags. Where did this come from? This output here, the file effect enumeration for create file and change file, dumps the output here, it's create file and change file. Also, the dumping itself isn't that important. But here is the actual input, the input of my fake nodes. These are hard coded. One is called how hard is it to start JS? This is being mentioned here. And, and it's an orphan, which means it doesn't have an incoming link. So that means the other node, which is called how to learn JavaScript, is supposed to have an incoming link. Where is this? In the node text, it's here. This is the, how, how the plugin figures out if a link exists or not. It's the plugin's responsibility to figure this out. It's the plugin's logic. And this is how the plugin, the other plugin, found hashtags. JS is here, JS is here, and hashtag professional is just here once. And these are just two demo nodes. So I wanted to say to see if the, the, the feedback is working, but it's not actually very interesting. This could be modified, and I'm going to share the link with you in a second. So this 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 fakes actual files on the file system, or the it's a stub, if you want to, to call it that. This is a node selection input. It can ask for all nodes, then it gets all nodes, it can ask for selected nodes, then it gets just one of these. There's no selection interface, so I'm stubbing with the first one. And then there's the text input. You see the manifest input selection. We, we've looked at this in the, in the short presentation at the beginning. You also get all text, then you get the whole string from the text view, and you get the selected text, in which case you get the range for user text change, which is basically just the selection range, but this is a particular property from text views to get the selected range, well, for user text changes. But I'm, I'm not sure when these ever diverge, but you're supposed to use these. And yeah, it's getting the range. The range is an NS range. Oops, sorry, didn't mean to click that. The range is an NS range. And if it exists because it's an optional, then it is fetching the substring with that range. This is not production code. Please, please have mercy. And this is a helper function um, which returns uh, the whole file name. This is important because my yeah my, my my actual application has the notion of IDs, which are not the file names, but like numerical IDs, which are stable, while the file names can change. And so this would be a helper that the script is calling. It's part of the utils package that I, that I that I skipped over. It's extracting node IDs from file names or from, 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 from contents. And the application's responsibility is to supply the node IDs. So the script, so not all the scripts that rely on these have to implement the same logic, like the same regular expressions or maybe even different regular expressions. And then you don't have a good user experience because each script has its own quirks. Each plugin has its own quirks. So this is a standard way the application provides access to this information. Uh, well, where are the plugins? I haven't shown any of these. Here are the scripts or the plugins. This is the, the tag counting thing. There's the manifest file, statistics of all tags, title and description. This is the user facing string. So author, version, release date, all metadata. And here is the input and output declaration. It gets, it, it requests access to all nodes and it requests access to a new file, yes, it wants to create a new file and on completion show file. That's the 
effect when the output is finished. And the actual script is here. It starts with a tag array or collection, dictionary, or whatever, not, not firm with the JavaScript terminology. Then there's the regular expression to extract hashtags from the whole node content. And for each node from all nodes, it gets the node content, matches the regex, and then increments a counter. And in the end, here's the sorting algorithm to well sort by, by count and then print count, space, hashtag, and the tag name itself, which is reflected in uh, this output. That is the actual output of the script here. Literal tags, new line, and then a list of tags. And that's the script that's being executed. Another, the other script, just for comparison, does also access, try to access all nodes, but the output is different. It, it, it outputs not to a new file, which might have any name, it's the app's responsibility, but it, it requests to change this file called orphans.txt and on completion again, show the file. And the rest is all metadata. And here you could also write, well, output into the, the selected text and I believe there's the tests, tests as tests, example scripts. Ah, I, I just wrote these two tests. Sorry. I thought I thought I had I had more tests like those that would that would show how to write JavaScript and the manifest file to access the, the selected text and replace the selected text, but apparently I didn't. Okay, so this is this is just executing the script in a JavaScript context, and it is basically demonstrating the same thing that the application is doing, like load the script that's done here, load the script called all tags, that's importing the whole folder as a bundle, the main JavaScript file and the manifest.json file, and then everything is being executed. This is an input provider stub, which is the input provider, and it provides no text, and it provides stub node contents, and then you get similar output here. Like this, these are the lines that are supposed to be the result of the execution. And again, it's a bit more boilerplate to set up these tests to execute the scripts, but it's still quite input output function in between. These kinds of tests obviously wouldn't work well with user interfaces. Then you're just in the in the wild west where you don't know yeah, where you where you where you have to do the manual QA tests, like click around and, and figure out where things break. Just like with good old AppKit itself, where you also have UI tests, but also also they're not that comfortable. And the same for the orphan nodes test again. Stopped input, the execution is the same, it's the same boilerplate, and there's the expected output with a fake link in between. Also a link to nowhere, this is not counting, it's, it's, it's not going to any, any of the existing nodes. So maybe, maybe this is useful for you.